Welcome to Micro, I'm Drew Hawkins, and this episode is a special interview with Grant Faulkner, author of books such as All the Comfort Sin Can Provide and Fishers, a collection of 100-word short stories. Grant is also the executive director of National Novel Writing Month, or NaNoWriMo, and co-founder of 100-word Story, a literary journal that's dedicated to, well, 100-word stories. And he's here today to talk about his newest book, The Art of Brevity, Crafting the Very Short Story, which just came out in February from the University of New Mexico Press. Grant Faulkner, great to have you with us. Yeah, thank you for having me, Drew. Um, yeah, really happy we're able to get this happening. I'm not sure if you knew it, but the show, Micro, actually gets its name from Microfiction. So we're big fans of the small, you know, our tagline is short but powerful writing. So I feel like this interview in this book is super appropriate. We're made for each other. <laughs> yeah, I, I did know that about your, your name, Micro. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Great. Glad to hear it. Um, yeah. And I, you know, it's funny, I, I, as I was coming up with my questions, I almost wanted to start with this kind of classic Stephen Colbert bit where he would say, you know, I wanted to say, you know, flash fiction, great fiction or the greatest fiction. But uh, what I really want to ask about, and, you know, you say this in the book where you're a writer who was trained and kind of a, pictured yourself as being a novelist writing in that classic kind of long form. And you saw um, that as basically your end goal, even when you were writing short stories, as you talked about, and while you were learning and when you were in school. So how did you come to find brevity? What drew you to writing these very short pieces? And then from there, what drew you to write a book about it? Yeah, I do think it's an interesting American thing, the way we privilege and reward bigness mm. in in many things. And, and so I think in... In the traditional kind of uh, way that one learns to write, you learn to write more and more and a big focus on more. And our MFA programs are kind of designed around that, that you you, you write short stories mainly kind of as a, a minor league training ground to write the novel. And so, I yeah, I was writing novels and writing longer stuff. I mean, I wrote short stories, but uh, mainly focused on writing novels. And uh, in the course of writing uh, what I call... Uh, my doomed novel. I've been working on this novel on and off for 10 years. One of those novels, you know, that you just can't give up. You just think one more draft. I'm going to nail it in this next draft. But anyway, um, a friend of mine posted a link to uh, some of his father's 100 word stories. And I, I read them. They were in the magazine 1111. And I just became entranced by them. And they were, he'd written 100, 100 word stories as his memoir. And I thought what was, so, what was so cool about them is that they were like these these uh, snapshots, you know, as if he was like clicking a button on a Kodak carousel and, you know, just seeing these little snapshots of his life. And so they allowed him to tell all these different stories of his life, the type of stories that wouldn't necessarily make it into a longer narrative, you know, like longer narratives are, are focused on a larger story arc. And these hundred word stories were these little snapshots of life. And they just allowed you to pay attention or invited you to pay attention to the, the smaller, the smaller parts of life, but not, mm. in, in, not any more insignificant. And so I started experimenting with the form and initially I couldn't get them anywhere near a hundred word stories because I was trained in more. And when I told him that I'd written some 150 word stories, he said, no, 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 you've got to, you've got to write shorter. You've got to hit 100 and the story will get better if you do. And it's not like a hundred is a magical number where your stories get better. It's the intense pressure that you put the story under and the intense attention. And so writing became also an exercise in editing. And you have to pay attention to every word and the rhythm of every sentence and then what you leave out of a story. And that um, that, that kind of art of omission was something mm. I really learned by writing short. And so the one thing I'll say, I, lo I love, I invite everybody, I think everyone should try writing a 100-word story, but the warning is they're really addictive. <laughs> you know, you give a lot of really great analogies and metaphors throughout the book for short writing and for brevity in general. Um, and I actually thought of one of my own while you were, um, while I was reading the book, it kind of reminded me, I'm not, if you sh not sure if you heard that concept where your eyes actually only take in about 20% um, of what you're seeing and the rest is really just a constru construct of your brain, right? Of your mind. And you talked about how flash fiction or short fiction, and I'm going to, you know, I probably should preface this 
with saying, I'm going to be just like you mentioned in the book, where we're using these terms interchangeably with short shorts, micro fiction, flash fiction, postcard fiction. But what we're, what we're talking about are really short pieces of writing, right? Yeah. And you mentioned that they attune the writer to the subterranean, the implied, the unsaid, the unseen. The world is always a little bit haunted in flash story in a flash story because of what's left out. And you just touched on that a little bit, but you mind maybe just expanding on when you choose these specific moments and there is so much unsaid, what does that mean? What is the effect of that on a reader? Yeah, I think what's interesting about the short form is you the reader becomes more of a collaborator in the story. I guess per your analogy, right? You're you're mm. you're just providing a lot of hints in the story. You're, you're focusing on what can be evoked. Mm. And so you're also uh, focusing on that subterranean, what's left out, the subtext that speaks through the text. And that's one thing that I really love about it is how, 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 how the reader, you're, you're demanding more of the reader because the reader is filling in the gaps and kind of making it his or her own story. Mm. So yeah, I think, I think there's a different, like author as in, the authority, the one who's going to tell you everything about the story, that kind of role of the author changes in a short mm. short. And sometimes I think about it, just to add one more analogy, because I love analogies <laughs> for storytelling, it's kind of like pl playing the Ouija board. Mm. And you're communicating with the other side, but you're not getting the whole story from the other side. You're just getting mm. all these little hints, all these little answers, and you have to kind mm. of keep filling in the gaps in the story. Mm. Yeah, you know, Another aspect I found was really interesting in your analysis and the way you kind of explored writing these short pieces is how much flax fiction actually mirrors reality. You talked about how life often does not really come with context. You know, nearly everyone we meet, we meet with really basic minimal surrounding information. We're in a classroom, they're on the subway. There's not this full context and backstory that people think a story needs. Um, and, you know, Another thing that you mentioned, too, is that even when we read novels, when we think about what we read, we don't think of the entire book. We think of individual scenes. We remember moments, these snapshots. And, you know, I got the sense as I was reading your book and thinking about my own writing and thinking about short writing in general is that this quote unquote experimental form that flash fiction is sometimes or microfiction is sometimes called is really not that strange or unusual. It's actually pretty natural um, mimicry of reality. So was that something that you yourself came to conclude as you were writing this book and trying to express your thoughts? Or is this something you've always felt um, was, a, was a draw or an element of working with short fiction? Gosh, I, th I think maybe both. I'm not sure when I began to think of that so much, but the book certainly crystallized a lot of those thoughts just because I had to articulate them. Mm. And, and I do think, um, it's, it's interesting that like just what you, how you put it, that, that the short form is actually more mimet mimetically kind of pure or true mm. than, than a longer work, which really is more contrived and shaped into a story. And, and that's what I like about it too, is because it, it, it changes the contours of a story. So mm. the, the, the shorter pieces, they don't have the, the kind of intense requirements of plot, for example. Like plots there, you know, as, since I read so thousands of submissions to 100 word story, I, I constantly get asked, can you, can you have a beginning, middle and end and character mm. change in just 100 words? And, and yes, you can. And usually there is. But the pivot sometimes is just like a little more subtle, a little less noticeable, because you're not reading for plot. You're immersed in this moment. And in fact, like like flash fiction itself, like the the name flash comes from a lightning bolt being mm. like struck down in the sky and flashing, illuminating the world in this one quick burst, you know. Mm. So so I think that the the metaphors for writing short shorts like change. Mm. Mm. And anytime I talk to a writer especially someone who's an editor and works with a lot of um, other pieces and, and, and revision in general, I always want to at some point talk about every writer's favorite part, part of the process, revision. And um, one, one, the, one quote I always try to keep in mind is uh, Kiese Lehman said that the most important part of writing and really life is revision. And you touched on this a moment ago, and you also explored this in the book, where you refer to the subtracting and removing of unnecessary words, phrases, and sentences as this intimate act. And I'd love to hear some more about what you mean by that and maybe touch on how revision with short, short pieces 
might differ, maybe take its own approach or what that looks like possibly as compared to working with longer form writing? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, revision is, you're mostly in the stage of revision with shorts, mm. or at least I am, and especially hundred word stories. Um, like I'll write a first draft that's, that's 93 words or 107 words. That's why I find my parameters are to start. But if you write a 107 word draft and then to get it down to a hundred, you might trim 10 or 15 words and then you have to add some words. And this back and forth with the words is kind of like a Rubik's cube where you're just kind of like shifting things around to try to get all the colors to line up. But in doing that, you're, you're thinking differently about the space of a story and you're actually in revision. You're, you're, you're paying so much attention to the story that it's evolving with each mm. like addition or subtraction. Mm. And so I think that that's where, uh, revision, um, does become an intimate act. And, and I compare it to, you know, like pruning a tree or, 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 or shaping a bonsai tree. Um, you know, to do that really well, you have to really get in touch with the tree itself and pay attention to, to the way it's going to naturally grow and the way you see it growing and to, and to kind of shape it and have a vision for it. So you're, you're, you're constantly molding the contours of it. And I think revision just makes you these short shorts that because, because everything is so concentrated and you really are trying to capture the essence of a story. And mm. so you just put so much pressure on everything and pay so much attention to everything in a way that you couldn't in the longer work, right? Because mm -hmm. if you have a 400 or 300 or 100 word story, you almost to memorize that story by the time you're done with it, you know, mm. whereas a novel, mm. you just, you're not going to be able to pay as much attention to each sentence. It's just be, you can't have, can't possibly have that time. Mm. Um, and it, for anybody who's listening, um, every end are. of the, <laughs> but every at the end of each section, uh, there's a little bit of a writing, an optional writing exercise, which I thought was really great to include. They're very, you know, they're, they're not mandatory. But I wanted to mention that one of the things I also really appreciated from this was almost like a reading list that you come by as the works that you reference and writers who are both still working today and have worked with this form in the past where I was peaked and I was like, wow, I want to look this guy. So, I, you know, for example, one of them is. Charles Baudelaire with Paris Spleen, which I hadn't heard of before. And that book is incredible. And you just reference people doing experimental things. I think at one point you talk about Meg Pillow, um, has a story, you know, has a specific story where she's working with footnotes. Um, and if you're, you know, new to this form or whether or not you're kind of seasoned with it, you're going to be exposed throughout this book to a lot of these different approaches to it. And one of the questions that kind of drew to mind for me, especially with specifically with Baudelaire, because he kind of, I think, referred to it as prose poetry. Do you see a difference between short, short writing and prose poetry? Is there, where does that, where does that line exist for you? What does it look like? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I write short, shorts. It is my form of poetry. I'm kind of like a frustrated mm. poet. Um, and I don't, but I don't see myself as exactly as a poet, but that's mm. where I find my poetry is in these short shorts. And that's what one thing that really attracts me to them. But in terms of the definition of, of what's a poem and what's a, what's a prose poem and what's a story, I, I heard one professor writer say that the author is in control. So mm. what you call it is what it is. And when I'm teaching Flash, I always give this example. I give Robert has his, um, uh, prose poem, a story about a body which is a real narrative poem. And if I read it to you now, you'd say that sounds like a story, mm. but he calls it a prose poem. And so I read it aloud to my students. And then I read a, a story of mine that is very prose poemy, but I call it a story and I ask them, it's a trick question. Of course, they, they I ask them to pick out the story in the prose poem, mm. but, um, you know, usually, usually they're wrong because Robert Haas calls his uh, a poem and I call mine a story. So I, I don't, I don't get too hung up on definitions to tell you the truth. Um, I think the main thing is just kind of feeling the story and, and, and expressing it. But, um, yeah, but, but, but like I said, I mean, I think that the, I think that the shorter form, because it works with a lot of the same tools as, as a poems, you know, you're, you're talking about containment and compression mm. and a focus on finding the essence and paying attention to the rhythm of the words in a sentence. Um, and paying attention to what has been omitted or the white space in a story. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of poetic techniques that are just kind of a natural part of writing short shorts. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about how those tools and those techniques 
can actually be beneficial for people who maybe don't necessarily write only short pieces, how working with short, short writing and practicing brevity can be useful for people who are either working on novels or your classic 7,000 word story, but how it's beneficial for your writing in general. Yeah, I think, I think one, like what you said earlier about revision, um, the intensity of revision uh, really helps me with my longer works. And in fact, like it's interesting because my short stuff influences my longer stuff much more th than vice versa. And it's, it's because I do like to piece together stories through fragments. I like to work with white space. I like to think of, of, of the contours of a story in a longer piece as, as being a lot about the snapshots, you know, that you mentioned. And I think it does get back to how to mimetically accurately capture life, you know, or the emotion of a character. And I really think that those like intense moments are, are the way to do that, to, to do it through the fragments. Mm. Mm. And, and you mentioned this earlier, how someone might get addicted to taking a shot at these hundred word stories. But if somebody is, you know, maybe new to this or they want to give it a shot, maybe they're either struggling in some short work they're doing right now or they don't know where to get begin. What would you say to them? You've been encouraging writers for a long time with NaNoWriMo. What would you say to somebody who's thinking about giving a shot or trying to plow through it when it comes to approaching short writing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, a lot of people are intimidated by the 100-word form. And when we first started 100-word stories, I mentioned this just because we invited a lot of really accomplished writers, usually like novelists, to, to help us launch the magazine by writing 100-word stories. And a lot of them told us that they couldn't, that they literally could not write a 100-word story, uh, story. And so so sometimes I don't want to start people off with that kind of like tight, you know, com limit. Um, but, but I would like say, you know, like, like every month on hundred word story, of the magazine, we provide a photo prompt and people write stories to that. And I think that that's a really good entry point. There's like a little community there. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, for me, I, I, I do a lot of, um, I just, I just, uh, one, one chapter talks about, um, found objects and found stories. And this gets into Baudelaire a little bit because he mm. was famous for being a flaneur in Paris and mm. writing, these short little snapshots of what he observed on the streets. And so I think um, one way that I write is, especially once I had kids and found myself on, on playgrounds with these kind of odd stray moments of time, mm. I would sometimes just get like a sentence that would appear to me. And just, I, I always kept a, um, a little notebook in my back pocket to, to write down thoughts and these little snatches of life. And so I think like um, thinking about the way that flash fiction makes you pay the attention to life differently mm. and just kind of mm. I think practicing that and trying to capture those small moments of life that really resonate though and really somehow change you or stay in your memory mm. and and then just like yeah putting them in a story and I think I think to start I wouldn't think so much about whether it's a hundred words or 200 words but think about brevity mm. and you know one of the exercises in the book since you mentioned that is to write a 500 word story and then to practice by cutting it down to 250. And I think like mm. that exercise in itself, like reveals, like, can you tell as good a story or a better story in fewer mm. words? You know, how can you learn to tell that story more effectively with fewer words? So things like mm. that. And so, and I always think I'll just say this is that to loop back to those novelists who couldn't write a hundred word story, it's largely about training your brain. I think it's it's almost like a track and field event. Um, mm -hmm. You can train your brain, uh, your storytelling brain, to to run a marathon, which would be a big saga of a novel, or you can train your brain to be a sprinter, and mm -hmm. or run different you know lengths of races. And 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 that's what I've done with with my brain. I've written so many hundred word stories that I've really kind of have this storytelling template in my head. Mm -hmm. Not like a template that I fill in the blanks, but one that I kind of understand the length and the nuances of a hundred word story. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how you talk about these mental exercises spilling over into your real life. But one of the ones that you talked about was where you challenge yourself to notice five things throughout the day. And it's surprisingly tricky. Like it's, it's not something you have to kind of consciously, consciously make this effort to do that. And, you know, this book is just riddled, whether they're, uh, you know, openly prescriptive as like a, writing exercise at the end or just casually mentioned in, in your narrative as, you know, here's the thing I've tried. Here's the thing I do. And, um, 
I found them to be, you know, something I've taken with me since I've read this and just helping kind of basically generate these ideas that are kind of all around you at all times. And if you're thinking about them in these snapshot moments where you're not necessarily stressed or concerned with how could this be a book, right? Um, that perhaps maybe they can grow there. But I have found myself maybe collecting these snapshots of something that I'd like to, once I get to a desk, because I'm at the park right now with my children, as you just mentioned right now, but where I'm just thinking of these moments that are really just um, fraught with so much complexity to it, but are almost a photograph that could be written as a story, right? Yeah, that's interesting how you say that writing the short shorts takes pressure off. Mm. Um, you know, because I think so often, like if you're a serious writer, you're putting pressure on yourself and you're thinking, is this publishable or how can I make it publishable? And especially if you're doing a novel that will take, you know, likely several years, that's a mm. lot to be carrying around. Mm. And, and they really do take that creative pressure off because if a story's not working, uh, mm -hmm. you can just move on to the next one pretty mm -hmm. easily. Um, and either just trash it or come back to it six months or a year later. I mean, I have a whole, folder just full of of half starts and nearly completed drafts and probably drafts that i'll never look at again but other ones i'll i'll you know kind of feel you know come come back to so i think there is something about the creativity for creativity's sake that mm -hmm. these invite in because you don't have much to lose you're not going to mm. lose years of your life with them right yeah it, and it's also i don't know if you're like me where you kind of feel like a sense of duty. Like I can't move on from this one. I have to finish this story. I can't move on from this short story. I have an idea for something, but I got to finish this story. And I feel like when I'm working with something short, it's not that I'm going to more willing to abandon it, but I am more willing to let's move on to something for a minute and maybe I'll come back to this. Whereas exactly. if it's something is a longer 15, 20 pager or maybe working on a novel draft, it's like, I got to get through this chapter. I have, I cannot. And yeah, so maybe it is a little liberating to kind of, hang on to the, you know, work on with these, with these shorter pieces and feel like you can move on if you need to. Yeah. Hence my 10 year doomed novel that I mentioned at the first, <laughs> I mean, these pieces right. were liberating from that. And, and they, they actually, I do want to say that they can help the long, longer writing mm. process because they gave me a sense of satisfaction that I wrote something and completed something and mm. that helped uh, rejuvenate my creative momentum. And they also, um, because I could send them out and get them published, that was very gratifying also. And I found that that fed my creative momentum. Mm. So, so I find that, you know, writing the short and the long, you know, there, there's a way to kind of juggle the two to, to get juice from each of them. Well, to borrow your, your running, uh, metaphor, it's very common for marathon trainers to mix in sprint tra interval training into their, into their there you conditioning go. work as well. Right. And I do want to say that I did ask you, um, you know, how can people approach if they're looking to get into this? And you could have easily just said, you know, buy this book. And you did. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a bad marketer, bad self promoter. No, no. And I think that's a great way to kind of, to wrap up the conversation and everything. Um, you know, pick up a copy of the art of, Bre uh, the art of brevity crafting the very short story at either your local bookstore online, or you can take a look, um, at Grant Faulkner's website at grantfaulkner.com. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention or, or leave us with? Well, well since since we're, we're talking about me as an inadequate huckster, um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll encourage people to sign up for my Substack newsletter, uh, Intimations sure. of Writer's Discord. And I'm currently um, actually excerpting chapters from the book uh, in that newsletter right now. So check it out. Great. And how can they find that? Uh, if you just go to Substack, um, it's called, I mean, you can probably just search for me in Substack. Otherwise, it's called Intimations, colon, A Writer's Discourse. Horrible name for a, for a newsletter, but um, I, I, I like it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, great. Thanks so much, Grant. Appreciate you stopping by. This was a great talk and uh, looking forward to working more of these exercises from the book. Oh, thank you so much, Drew. You, you provided a really good reading of the book, so I really appreciate that. Of course. Take care. Yeah, you too.